All right, so I did not know what I wanted to do for a video tonight. I have lots of ideas, but some of them I want to save for like Vlogmas. All those ideas are just like, mm, no. And then I realized, you know, you've got all these books. I've got stacks of books and, and some of them are right here that I'm going through while I'm writing right now. And I, you know, I've got to have all the right quotes and everything. And when you've read a book well enough or often enough to know it well enough to search, you know what quote you're looking for. You just got to find the right one. Google is your friend. <laughs> I mean, it is awesome. But if you don't know what you're looking for, you just know that you want to highlight something in that book. Either you haven't read it yet, or you're in the middle of it, or you started reading it, or you read it 10, 15, 20 years ago, and now you're like, was it in that one? Or was it, you know, all those things. I mean, all the things, right? <laughs> so I, I thought, you know, I'm just going to share the research books I'm using right now. And because I'm writing a t contemporary book about a bookstore, my research isn't, you know, heavy historically kind of stuff. It's not heavy technical kind of stuff. Like, you know, I mean, I sometimes I go some deep dives into specific guns. Why someone would choose this gun over that gun because I'm writing suspense and I got to know what about the gun, you know. All the research I did on trank guns for animals and why they don't use them for people and you know, trying to figure out what would make someone find out that they, they had come up with something because I've got a, a whole series that deals with that, you know. Those are, this is a very different kind of research than like literary research, you know, what books are going to draw people in. And I just realized I need to I need to bring in the lost library. Cause is it the lost library? I think it's the lost library, the one with the cat on the cover and the little free library and, and the ghosts and the yeah. Oh, well, it's not in this stack, but I've already told you about that one, so that's okay. And I think a couple of these have been mentioned at some point or another, but I'm bringing them in for this. And so, one sip. Oh, I think it's still too hot. So, the tea that I showed you getting me ready for tonight, uh, this is the, yeah, it is Harney. It looked like it was a K, and I'm like, have I been saying this wrong all these years? But no, the Harney and Sons Victorian London Fog. I love this tea. By the way, just taking the lid off and smelling it. Amazing. I, I'm going to create a candle for this tea because it smells so good. But when I make it, I use, I, I turn this into a, a kind of a foofy drink because I use half and half in it, a little bit of sugar, and I actually put a splash of um, vanilla in it, just a tiny bit. But, oof, it's, it, I mean, it's, I don't even know if it's a whole quarter teaspoon. It, I just pour a little bit in a cap, and then I pour a little of that cap into the cup. I mean, I just a little bit, but it does something, and I think it's because of the half and half. Mm, man, it just gives it that extra punch. So, okay, so this is Shatona and Research for Clock Tower Bound. Um, I research as I write as well as before I write. So, um... I've done tons before this. This is what I'm just working through right now. Kindle, okay, look, I am a physical book person. I love physical books. I will read a Kindle in a heartbeat, not a problem. Traveling, yes, it's my friend. But for research, if I'm doing actual, actual researchy kind of things where I'm looking up historical stuff and whatever, Kindle is your friend because you can search you can search the Kindle book and it will bring up all the stuff related to whatever. So when I was researching for my Madeline series, you know, she's really interested in photography. So I would be looking up the books on the original Brownie cameras and I could do searches for different things. And I could find it when I was looking up how, when I was learning how to do the processing of plates and stuff at the time. Same thing. So I... I love Kindle for research, so I just had to pull that out and say, hey, yo, if you're, if you're wanting to do research on something, seriously consider the Kindle. Yeah, I like to highlight and I like to have the book in my hand, but that is so much easier to look up and, and just get to what I'm looking for if I've already done the general research. If I'm doing general research, I'm, looking, I'm just looking for ideas and whatever, I want to read the whole book. If I'm looking for a specific answer, Man, that thing, that thing is, um, 
whatever. I, I don't have these in any particular order, although some of them are in stacks because they're right off the shelf and I just put them back on the stack on my table here. So some of them will be in groups. Like I think all the Montgomery's and Jean Stratton Porter's, those are all in groups. But uh, this one, I'm just going to mention in passing, I'm, you know, flipping through it at times to read the stuff that I haven't read yet because this is a big part of the book. It's kind of what, it's what's going to solve a big problem in, in the main character's life. So, uh, how about I do that again? Uh, this is Road Trip Fresca, Becca Werbel. I've talked about it before, so I, you know, I, I wasn't going to talk about it a lot. But it, the least I could do is give you the name, the author, Werwell, you know. So anyway, this is this is something I, I am looking into. I don't want to, I'm going to put it back over here on the table. Because otherwise I will be making a mess. Okay, now this, okay, wait a minute. Let me find, where are you, Ella? Yeah, okay, so if you've never read... Elemental P by Mark Dunn. I'm, I'm going to say just, just hit pause on this, close it out, whatever. Go buy the Kindle, the audio, do so. No, you don't actually, don't read this one on audio. You're going to miss the fun. I don't know if it's even available on audio, but if, if it is, it shouldn't be because you can't get the genius of this book on audio. So, what Elemental P does, see, I'm trying not to move it, but it's so hard. I talk with my hands. But what Elemental P does is, um, is it is it a pangram or is it panogram? I think it's pangram. But the quick, okay, so when I was in school, it was the quick red fox jumped over the lazy brown dogs. That's what Mrs. Elkins taught us. And she's the best teacher ever. So if she taught us, it's that's how it should be. But they've since shortened it to like the quick fox jumped over the lazy brown dog. Or maybe dogs. I don't know. They changed it. They, they took out something. Well, anyway... This is the story of a guy who created either that one or some other one. I can't remember if it was that one or some other one. And I, I feel like there was a contest to see, you know, if you could do it in fewer letters than that sentence. But I don't remember if that was in this book or in another one. It could have been another one. But in here, this town is really proud of this man because he's the one who created this very popular sentence. And so over town hall, they have the entire alphabet as like part of the decor and they, everything in the town, they're all just really, 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 really proud of this guy. And so the, the entire, it's an epistolary novel. It's all told in the, in the letters from this one gal to her friend. I don't know if there's replies or if it's just letters. I feel like it's just letters to the friend. Maybe it could be like newspaper articles too. I can't recall. But anyway... <laughs> One day, one of the letters falls off and they decide that this is like this guy from the beyond saying, don't use that letter anymore. So they quit using, they quit allowing that letter. I'm going to say it's C. I don't remember what the first one was, but we're going to go with C because that's a really easy one. You can either replace it with an S or a K in any word and people will still understand what the word's supposed to be. So nobody's allowed to use that letter anymore. So when she's writing, she's telling about this. And she's spelling all the words without that letter. Well, then another letter falls. And what Mark Dunn did, that sounds like some terrible grammar, but what Mark Dunn, how Mark Dunn used that in this book, I just can't say it, <laughs> is that he wrote the entire book from the, each point, for, for each letter that falls, he the rest of the book doesn't use that letter at all. And it just goes through, and it, it gets it gets ludicrous, and, and how they have to like change the word that they want to use, and the crazy spellings, and oh my goodness, it is so, so funny. Well, 
this one will, I, I, pretty sure it will be in here somehow. I have, I, I'm, I, well, okay, I've got it in right now, but I don't know if it's going to stay where it is, if I'm going to move it or if I'm going to cut it. I, I haven't decided, but that one's in there. But there's also this other book by him that is, okay, it's not as good. It's not, but it is pretty, <laughs> it's pretty funny. So Mark Dunn in this one, Mark Dunn is the character. So the author is also the character. And what it is, is he has, he has written a book about a three-legged man who was part of a sideshow. And he sends the book to his publisher or editor, one of the two, probably both, but he sends it to this guy and he says, you know, here it is. It's taken me two years. Um, the footnotes aren't in here. I'll send the footnotes separate, but I um, wanted to get this off to you. So glad it's done, basically. And then he says, and you know what's coming when he says it. And because it's literally the first letter, I feel like I can get away with um, telling you. He says, whatever you do, be careful. This is the only copy. The other one accidentally got shredded. Well, we know what happens the minute we read that, right? So the manuscript, the the story of this guy's life is gone. Uh, I won't tell you how, but it, it it's gone, and you can you can find that out for yourself. But then all he the 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 editor is just like can't can't you rewrite? And he's like, I don't want to rewrite it. I just like no. And then he writes a letter to his brother. Can you believe this? But the editor asks for the footnotes, and so this book is the fictional footnotes of a fictional book written by a fictional author who is actually the author of this book. <laughs> and so I figured this needs to be in there. Uh, people people need like an introduction to this book. This book is so funny. It is just so funny. Again, it's, it, I think, you know, Element OP has a, has a stronger plot, but this is still really, really clever and it's really, really fun. And I, if you love books, yes, because yes, Lucille Moritz entered Jonathan's life through the peeled back tarpaulin flap of a Chautauqua lecture tent. They don't talk about the Chautauquas very much anymore, but when I was a kid, People would, they would assume that that's what my name was and they would call me Chautauqua. And obviously it's not. So, yeah. There are other letters in, in here, but it's just oh, so funny. So I'm trying to, trying to find ways to put a bid in just because you want to share the fun books. And then let's see. I'm going to mention this one because I've mentioned it recently, so I don't want to, I don't want to talk too much about it, but this is The Garden at the Edge of Beyond. It's like a fantasy devotional. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how else to put it, but see all those tabs? Yeah, some of those places in here will end up in the book because she's going to recommend this book to someone who is looking for a devotional that won't bore her to tears and actually I think it's a guy can't remember so some of the I th right now I have way too many of the quotes they've got to come out but I have to decide which one I think is best and so this will definitely definitely be part of it Michael Phillips there's a whole series of these but they're not all in this wonderful binding with the purple ink I mean I don't know if it'll show, but the ink is purple and it's just, I love this. So anyway, this one is definitely going to be a part of it. I just don't know what part. Also, when I was at Dove Cottage in um, Grasmere, where, where Wordsworth lived, this is um, an anthology that his sister had their like letters and there there are a couple of poems and everything in it so I thought this would be a fun one I paid eight pounds for it from the Wordsworth Trust but there's even 
just whatever. But yeah, letter, letter, letter from this journal. I, I knew there was more than just letters. So journals, but then there's there, there's at least a couple of poems I recall. And some of it is really really simple. Eleventh of February. Walked with Coleridge near Stowey. The day pleasant but cloudy. Not near sorry. They have S A W R E Y, which they told us is pronounced sorry. There is near sorry and far sorry. <laughs> and <laughs> I loved that so much. So anyway, these this will definitely end up in here because the Wordsworth did spend time with Samuel Coleridge, and my character's name is Milton Coleridge. So I decided now that I have this, I want to do something with that. And then I'm going to put. Okay, so I'm hoping when I bought The Gray Mask, I did not realize that there were several books before this, I think. They show it in the back as this being like the fourth here. So I don't know if these other ones come first. But I want to find enough about this one. I'm just kind of reading through it. But I want to find enough about this one to add it into the book just as a someone's looking for some, a different kind of mystery. So Patricia Wentworth wrote about a governess turned detective. Yeah. My dog is snoring. Uh-oh. The heater just turned on. I hope it's not too obnoxious. Because I'm not going to get up and turn it off. I'm going to be that person. You noisy old thing. So, <laughs> anyway, I'm just, I, I really hope that I will find a reason in here for her to recommend it to someone. If I don't, it won't make it in the book. Or if I find a, a reason it's better for another book. That's the problem. When you do these research and you read all these books and you're like trying to get all the information for one book, you discover that, oh, well, maybe, mm, maybe it's better for another book. Uh, I don't know. Okay, so these are some of the books I bought on reading and or this one's really not on reading. So I'll start with this one. So this is The Mind of the Maker by Dorothy Sayers. She was... A, a brilliant woman, Christian woman. I, I just barely started on this one. But I think she did her own translation of Dante's Inferno, even. But uh, it had, I, I bought it because in Something About Waters by Madeline Langle. I can't remember. It was Something About Waters. Anyway, in that one, she recommended this book and she did the introduction. When I was look when I was looking for books for this, I saw the the contents, and that's why I did it. So the laws of nature and opinion, the image of God, idea, energy, power, the energy revealed in creation, free will, and miracle, the energy incarnate in self-expression, maker of all things, maker of ill things, Pentecost, the love of the creature, scaling trinities. Problem, picture, postscript, the worth of the work. So, um, she, I, I've read, like, Lord Peter Whimsey, obviously, and I've read her book, Are Women Human? It's really an essay. It's not a book, but it's a tiny little essay, Are, Are Women Human? It's one of my favorite things. All They call her a feminist, and it's really funny because she, I don't think she would call herself that because that would be going contrary to what she was striving for in the first place. You know, that this isn't about all things women, all things men and, and fighting against each other. It's just, are we human? Can I be, can I enjoy something because I'm human rather than because I'm a woman or because I'm a man? Can it just be because I'm a human? I I think this will be something that Milton is reading. It sounds like something that my, my character Milton will enjoy and find intriguing. And I'm hoping that it will, because you know, my, my main character, my protagonist, Anne, she's, she's very Anne Shirley-esque. And, um, it's not that she's not intelligent, but she enjoys the more romanticized side of life. But yeah, so this one, I, I don't know how much will make it in there, if it works or not, because like I said, I just got started on, on kind of flipping through that. Haven't done much with it yet. Okay, then I have three books on reading 
because books about reading are always a fun thing. I have C.S. Lewis's The Reading Life. It's the joy of seeing new worlds through others' eyes. And I feel like this were this was essays. Why we read. But anyway, I have not started this one at all. But when I pulled out several books about reading, this is one of the ones I bought for this series. Not necessarily for this book, but for this series. And so I grabbed it just in case. I don't know if I'll be reading or not. But isn't it beautiful? I just I love it. I think I, I think I actually got this at the Grand Marais bookstore. But I got it when because I'm, I pulled it out because I'm like, yeah, there's that. But then I also have, and it, this one might have been something else I got at the same place. Not sure. Once Upon a Tomb, I think it is. Um, but it's Welcome to Sotherians, one of the oldest bookshops in the world with weird and wonderful clientele, suspicious cupboards, unlabeled keys, poisoned books, and some things that aren't even books, presided over by one deeply eccentric apprentice. So I thought I wanted to flip through this and see if I can find out. Oh, it's got, oh, it's got footnotes and they look like they're kind of funny. Uh, but I want to see if, it, if it's something basically that I, even if I haven't read it all, if it's safe to mention, because I really do try not to put books in in this series that I wouldn't recommend unless I make it clear in a text. It's like, I mean, like someone just mentioned a Clancy book, I think. I've never read it, but it's obvious that I haven't because they don't even know where this book came from. They don't know anything about it. So it's not like anyone's recommending it. So I want to be able to see if I can recommend it so I have to read fast because this book has to get done fast but I do want to see if I can put that in if not it'll be in the next one so it's no big deal and then here's another Christopher Morley book Ex Libris Carnissimus 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 I don't know what that means but these are Bibliography as a hobby, three kinds of collectors, escaped into print. They're just about carrier pigeons. <laughs> Wine that was split, spilt in haste. Robinson's Crusoe's mistake, Twain, Mark Twain's hair, his debt to Thoreau. Um, so just, they're just, it's a book about books and conversations about books. And so I'm obviously... <laughs> I just, I want to tell you a little story of how life comes to heal after literature. The theme, if any, of these afternoons really is the inextricable interweaving of life in literature and the truth that literature is embedded in life and can't be put into textbooks and analyzed and discussed as though it were a laboratory process. <laughs> so, I mean... it. This is so morally that I'm like, yeah, I, I want to see, make sure I can't have... That's a Milton book for sure. All right, so those are all... And, and most of that would be Milton. It Not all of it, but I think most of that is definitely a Milton-esque kind of thing. And Milton Coleridge is... That's what he does, is he's saving these bookstores. He usually works with major corporations, but he started doing bookstores on the side, and <sighs> Anne's going to get him in her store and try to save it, and it can't be saved without major changes, but that's okay. So, next up, Anne, her, so she says on, but her mom pronounces it Cezanne, right? Uh, her name is Cezanne, because I have to say it like her mom wants it, right? Montgomery. She is like, she loves all things Anne. If you've ever seen the channel Darling Desi and the way that she just loves to dye her hair red and put the freckles on, well, this is who Anne is. And so, and Anne actually takes inspiration from people like her and the Cottage Fairy and like Morgan Long and 
Randy Reed. She kind of takes some inspiration and eventually, you know, does a few videos about the store trying to drum up business. I, it's not the solution for the store, but it's great for YouTube. <laughs> YouTube benefits, but it's not going to help the store. But she's desperate, and so she does it. So because it's she's all things Anne, she loves Anne Shirley, but she also loves, and so does her best friend or ex-best friend, uh, Nadia, she lo they love also Jean Stratton Porter because the Burn, Indiana is like six, 11, one of the two miles from Geneva where Jean Stratton Porter lived, where the Limber Lost is, where those, most of her books, Porter's books take place. Most, not all. Um, so because of that, I, I also need a lot of Annishness. So I, I have the journals, which I didn't get down. I've kind of gone through them and didn't find what I was looking for for the book. So I left them out. So those aren't, I bought all the journals and I read through some of it and I'm like, yeah, this isn't what I'm looking for. So I just set it aside. I'll read them later, but that's okay. That's what happens with research. You discover that some of it's not good. I, I pulled out Lorna Dune. I want to flip through it. Um, I've read it several times. It's, it's really, it, if you've ever seen the adaptation, the adaptation's pretty good. I really, really loved it. And I think Blackmore I don't know this to be true, and I might be remembering the wrong name, but I believe my dad told me when I was a kid that Blackmore did not like Edgar Allan Poe. He was, like, really um, opposed to Poe, which I think is kind of funny. So, um, but I, so I'm looking for it because I feel like Anne Shirley would have loved Lorna Doone. And would have read Lorna Dune. And so I think my Anne, well, I don't think. I know my Anne Razor, but will it make it into the book? Again, I don't know. Fun fact. So my dad sings a ballad about um, California Joe, who was a real scout back in the 1800s. He was actually a horrible, terrible man. <laughs> but... He did one thing that was truly beautiful. Uh, there was an Indian raid and they attacked and killed this man and his daughter escaped. And Jim Bridger and California Joe found her and saved her and then found her uncle. And she went, you know, off of the uncle. Well, he found her 13 years later and married her. And then was just a horrible husband to her. But, I mean, it's, so my dad had this ballad. It's a beautiful ballad. It leaves off all the ugly. <laughs> but when I wrote Argosy Junction, I took, in my head, I used the tune from that song. That song is 26 verses with eight lines to a verse. It's a long song. My dad didn't sing it very often. And I always, I always was really careful as to when I requested it because we'd all be there in the family. He'd be playing and people would request songs. And I knew the right moment to ask. And it, oh, I haven't asked for like three or four times. So now's the time to ask. I, I Because if you got him at just the wrong time, he wouldn't do it. And so I, I got good at figuring out when I could get dad to sing that song. <laughs> so when I wrote Argosy Junction, I used the tune... To create a ballad about the whole story of Lorna Dune. It's all condensed into one ballad. It's terrible. Okay, guys, I'm just going to say it. it's terrible. <laughs> but I did it because I wanted to do that for dad. And, I, you know, I don't think it's really kind of funny. I don't think he thought it was as bad as it is. But I think he was just so impressed that I actually did it in a way that he would recognize the tune that it kind of blinded him. And that's not common for my parents. My parents, I kind of like them. We're not those people that, oh, you're my kid, so everything you do is amazing. Uh, yeah, no, that, mm -mm. <laughs> So the fact that he didn't absolutely hate it 100% was pretty cool for me as, you know. But uh, yeah, so I actually wrote Lorna Dune as a ballad once. For reasons that make zero sense. I absolutely did not need to do that. I don't know why I did. It's it's truly terrible. But if you've ever read Argosy Junction, it's at the end. 
Yeah. So anyway, that's going to be in there. Um, so Magic for Marigold, we're getting into Ellen Montgomery now. Magic for Marigold was one of my favorite Ellen Montgomery books. I read it this year. I know I've talked about it a lot. But there were some great lines in here. And of course, there it says, of all seasons, Marigold loved autumn best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Marigold is reminding her, aren't you going to say your prayers? And she's like, no use waking God up at this hour of the night. <laughs> and you're just, yes, yes, yes. I wish Paula would repent in winter. That's the best time for repenting. <laughs> I mean, yes, because yes. But Montgomery just does these beautiful things with words in a way that isn't cumbersome. You know, a lot of atmospheric and and almost poetic description gets really heavy and it weighs down a story for most authors but she just does it I love it spring was a lovely time when the harbor was quivering was a quivering shimmering reach of blue and the orchard was sprinkled with violets and the nights were like a web of starlight that web of starlight I'm like yes so yeah some of this will like that web of starlight, I'm pretty sure that's, if it's not in there already, it's in a, a a document. You know, there's a bunch of little documents for each chapter and each scene in the chapter. And I'm pretty sure that's a quote in one of them saying, yeah, don't forget that. Because, because yes. Okay. Now, I have not read The Golden Road or The Story Girl. I think The Story Girl is... One of, if not, Chantal Reads All Day. I think it might be Chantal's favorite. But this is like a sequel-ishness because it says, Introduced in the Story Girl, Sarah Stanley, born of her imagination, a strong sense of fun, is her most enchanting heroine since Anna Green Gable. So I think this is a sequel. But my nose suddenly is crazy itchy. I, 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 I don't understand. But, so I decided I wanted to see if there's anything in these. And since it's more Montgomery right now, these are getting actually shoved over onto the read this November stuffness. And I hope it works. So, yeah. And then because of those, I have this arc of the Ladies of the Lake, Kathy Golke. I Golke is amazing. But... When she's forced to leave her beloved Prince Edward Island to attend Lakeside Ladies Academy, the last thing Adelaide Rose McNeil expects to find is three kindred spirits. So they're the ladies of the lake, and it's it's just all it's just their stories. And I feel like so it's like May 1935, 17, May 35. So it's kind of jumping around time-wise, but mostly around 1935. But this is another one that I want to read because I feel like this is definitely something that Anne would want to recommend. It's clearly some sort of women's fiction. They call it historical fiction, but it feels like historical women's fiction. We'll see. But so that one actually got put on my November shelf, which means a couple of those are probably going to have to come down. I haven't read in three days. I'm like... I feel like I'm losing my brains. <laughs> it's a, mm -hmm, yeah. All right. Then lastly, now this one, I'm going to do this one first. Uh, I talked about it before. You see all the, the tabbing I did. I did it deliberately when I read it because of the, of this book. Because this is Jean Stratton, Porter, Keeper of the Bees. This is one of the books that is not written in or near the Limber Lost. This is in California. But there's so much rich depth in this. Uh, someone told me if you read Jean Stratton Porter from the very first book in, in like order of publication. From the first through this I think is the last one. I don't know how I could miss in that huge print that it's the last one. But yeah. This one, you can see her faith journey. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It just really is. What I want to get now, I don't have any of her nonfiction. And I want the nonfiction. I'm seeing quotes everywhere. 
And I'm like, it's from these books that I've never heard of. And so I, I've got to find those because I think I have a lot to learn from her. Now, The Harvester was the first book by Porter that I ever read. It is one of the most deeply romantic books I've ever read. And I still liked it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how else to put it. I still liked it. Um, but it's the story. You've got a guy, they, they he calls where he lives and works, Medicine Woods. He's He harvests. He's the harvester. He harvests things like wild ginseng and um, mullein and oh, I, I couldn't name all the, the plants that he harvests and like he dries them very carefully and sells them to pharmaceutical companies. You know, this is the early 20th century, so it's pretty common for companies at that time still to be using herbs and he like he does a lot of wood carving and he just he lives in this this how this little like cabin in the middle he has a dog he has a peacock I think the peacock's name is Ajax but he has a peacock I mean it's crazy but then every spring he asks the dog if they're gonna keep living their wonderful life as they do or if he should go courting and every year until the the year in this one, the dog says, it pretty much says, no, we're staying home. You know, the dog just kind of reacts properly. But there was something in this guy's voice that clearly unsettled the dog. And the dog uh, basically says, you know, it basically responds to, yes, go courting. And this guy is mad. I think he even kicks the dog and then feels terrible about it later. But at the moment, he just kind of loses it. And, but then he has a vision that he of this gal he calls his dream girl walking across the lake and I can't remember the name of that lake I think it starts with an S mm -hmm. but it the, she's walking across the lake and he's like wow would it be like that and then he sees her at the train station and it's a whole story about how he can't find her and he's looking everywhere and when he does find her he's got to try to help her she has a debt to pay so he's working to pay it and she works herself into a feverish pitch and he, he, I mean, it's, there's so much, there is so much to this story and it is beautiful. And so obviously I want quotes from this one in the book because, you know, it's one of my favorites of hers. Keeper of the Bees might be my favorite, but on the other hand, I feel like this one is, because, I mean, guys, I found this one on my shelf. I don't know where it came from. It was just there. I was pregnant and I was looking for something to read that I hadn't read. I hadn't read? Yeah, I hadn't read. Yeah, but I hadn't read yet. And I, I was like, what's that? So I pulled it off. I started reading. My husband didn't know where it came from. We don't know where the book came from, but we loved it. And even my husband loved it. So, you know, there's that. So then I started buying more. I think the next one I read was Freckles. And Freckles is about a, an Irishman, he's missing a hand, and he's he's looking for a job, he wants so hard. He's like, Marty Robbins has the song, Mr. Shorty. Yes, Neville, Mr. Shorty, yes. And in Mr. Shorty, he, this, this man just comes in, he's looking for a job, he's looking for the, a chance to prove himself, and um, people always underestimate him because he's so short and it causes problems. Well, in this, it's the kind of the same thing, but they underestimate him due to the missing hand and the guy who's running this logging company says, you know, if you can walk, they have like a, a wire stretched around this perimeter where they're allowed to pull out, you know, they have beautiful walnut trees and different like bird's eye maple. And there's a lot of just great trees in there. The dogs are going to howl now. There's a siren out there. How long do you think it's going to take? But anyway, so he's basically, it's like if you can walk it to keep people from stealing those trees before we can get to it to cut it down, they're, they're trying to cut it down to, you know, sell this wood to furniture makers. There's a lot of furniture makers in that area, which I didn't know when I read this book, but there's a lot of furniture a lot of furniture makers in Bern, Indiana. 
And so now I know why they were, you know, doing this. But basically his job is just to watch and make sure that nobody has cut that line or tried to get a treat out of there in any way. And so he's got himself a, a club and he walks the line. He's terrified. And then it's just the story of how he... How he kind of comes into his own. There's a scene in here. If you've ever seen The Quiet Man, actually, that that scene is in there. Someone's talking about it. But if you've ever seen The Quiet Man, it's okay, Neville. It's okay. He started to howl. <laughs> if you've ever seen it, that big fight scene at the end, it's kind of got a moment like that in there. Someone is trying to bribe him to let them steal a tree and he just goes after him you will not I will not dishonor my boss I will and it is just the most fabulous mm. so yeah that made it in here but there's some good quotes that have also made it in here um laddie where's my laddie well I, there's already a couple of laddie quotes so I'll put laddie up here laddie's the book that I, I bought another copy of another note that word another I have one already but I bought that really beautiful floppy where they had rebound it yeah that one yeah um it laddie is an amazing one and the best quotes I'm finding the best I'm hold on let me let me show you a couple of the quotes from laddie because I bet I bet my face is going ghost white right now but Okay, so one of the one of the best things in Laddie. So there's this thing where you basically you can there's a Sunday school prize for the one who can recite the most verses, and everybody kind of assumes it's just going to be in a row, right? You know, you're going to do the twenty third Psalm, or you're going to do Psalm one hundred nineteen if you really want to go crazy. This kid hand picks verses, and oh my goodness. I'll bet I can find it in here. I'm just going to read this little section. One, said the recording secretary. Jesus wept, answered Leon promptly. There was not a sound in the church. You could almost hear the butterflies pass. Father looked down and laid his lower lip in folds with his fingers, like he did sometimes when it wouldn't behave to suit him. Two, said the secretary, after just a breath of a pause. Leon looked over the congregation easily and then fastened his eyes on Abram Sanders, the father of Absalom, and said reprovingly, Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Abram straightened up suddenly and blinked in astonishment, while father held fast to his lip. Three, called the secretary hurriedly. Leon shifted his gaze to Betsy Alton, who hadn't spoken to her next-door neighbor in five years. Hatred stirreth up strife, he told her softly, but love covereth all sins. Things were so quiet, it seemed as if the air would snap. Four, the mild blue eyes traveled to the men's side and settled on Isaac Thomas, a man too lazy to plow and sow land his father had left him. They were not so mild, and the voice was touched with command. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. <laughs> Still the silence. <laughs> I, I, I will ruin the rest for you. <laughs> but it's, it gets better and better. And that dad, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, the kid gets in some serious trouble, but it, it's totally worth it. Um, Okay, let's just skip along. Let's move. Yeah, this is, I think this is one of the quotes maybe that I put in this one. Turn her loose out of doors. Give her good books and leave her alone. You won't be disappointed in the woman who evolves. Yeah. Um, this one is in there. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Families were made to cling together and stand by each other in every circumstance of life, joy or sorrow. Of course you need your family. And actually, uh, that, that has, that's going to fit with like the church family in the book. But, um, I loved words that filled your mouth and sounded as if you were used to books. So obviously, right. So yeah, there's so many, so, so, so many. Now I, I don't have my girl, the limber lost. I don't know where it is. 
I, I have a feeling I've loaned it out and it's either that or it's in that closet. Uh, it could be in that closet, but I feel like I may have loaned it out and then of course it, it's gone. But that my, my laddie isn't in here and my, um, our father's daughter, no, her father's daughter, her father's daughter, that one I'm starting to think that I have a poor opinion of. And I think it's unjust. So I want to reread it. But I don't know if I'll get to that one before this. Um, Freckles comes home. I grab, you know, like I said, I grab them all at the same time. Freckles come home just doesn't do anything for me. I didn't really care for it. I don't think she should have done a sequel. But whatever. But I, I grabbed it in case for some reason I wanted to make sure that something I'm remembering from the story wasn't from that one instead of from the first one, just in case. But I, I really, I just grabbed them all. And then when I started to put it back, I changed my mind. So there's that. And then, okay, this one's really kind of weird. So this is Michael O'Halloran. I cannot tell you anything about this book. I thought I hadn't read it. But then I started seeing a couple of quotes from it. I wonder if I can find one. And the quotes were familiar. And so at that point, I was like, um, maybe I have read it. Because I'm not finding it. Because I, I recognize the quotes. And I don't see how I could have uh, recognized the quotes. So, um, yeah, Michael O'Halloran and uh, her father's daughter, they, they will probably make it in the book somehow but so yeah those are the ones that I'm kind of I don't want to say I'm reading because I'm not just like reading 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 but I am those three over there I need to be reading and a couple of them over here I will read parts of I just want to make sure that I'm not putting something in there that there's a problem with and so I have to at least read that much but I didn't realize how much I have bought for it it that I didn't have in there and that like I forgot that I have that ladies of the lake and that needs to be something that is recommended but I want to make sure that I I have no doubt that I can recommend it it's Kathy Gulke of course I can but just because I'm that confident doesn't mean that it's not going to somehow some way just not be the kind of book that my character would recommend you know what I mean so there's I have to deal with that and I'm just like Arr. so even like some of the ones that I got um like this one I can bring this one into it I'll put an asterisk if I haven't finished it but I can bring this one into it if a customer mentions it and says you know do you have this I heard about this etc etc so that readers can find out that there is this book out there but with my asterisk in the book list in the back it'll, they'll know that hey I, I can't recommend it because I haven't read it so if I don't get to it it can still be mentioned but I, I need to know if I possibly can because it would be better if it can come from her so anyway that's my reading research that's how it works for me for a book like this. It's totally different for other books. So there you go. I wanted to show you. So I think someone's going to bring in. There's there's a book called The Legend of Susan Dane. Cannot remember the author. And, and that book. It's really funny too. Because on the cover of the book that I have. She's got a really deep. Almost Mexican tan. And, you know, because it's, it's the Californios and, and during that period. And so it, she's got the, it, it's, but seriously, when the guy sees in the book, when the guy sees her, the main guy, because it's totally a romance. But when he sees her, he calls her, he calls her snow. He's like, nieve. And it's just like, and, you know, because her skin is so white, which is ridiculous. Can I just say it's ridiculous? Because... A lot of those Californios were of strong Spanish descent, and a lot of them were very fair-skinned. They had green eyes. They had red hair. They weren't all darker. And so, I mean, hello, not all of them, but there were quite a few. And so I'm just like, this would not have been so unbelievable to for someone to see this. And I go, what? You know, but they make it this... Uh, uh, 
I have so many problems with that book, but I'm going to have someone bring it in and have her be like, oh, this is going to be great. And then start reading it and have all the problems with it that I do just so that I can have that catharsis because that's what writing these books is all about. <laughs> anyway, um, that's what I'm researching. Got any books that need to be added in there? Got any favorite quotes from, from Gene Stratton Porter, Ellen Montgomery, uh, Christopher Morley that isn't Haunted Bookshop or Parnassus on Wheels because I've already done those. Any any authors similar to those? I, I think I might go see about Emily from Deep Valley. See if there's any really good lines from that one because that feels very Anne-esque to me. Also, manga. I've got a character in this book that bless her little heart she she reads it because it's what her brother likes and she wants he you know he he involves her in his reading and in, in and he he's interacts with her he's a good big brother but he's totally clueless to the fact that you know his little sister is giving up herself to be with him spend time with him just kind of like women do with guys sometimes it's kind of a fun little thing there so I, I need, um, Chantel has helped me. She's got a couple of them, but I need more manga-ish stuff. And, you know, but what else? Other authors like Gene Stratton Porter. Is Are there other ones that I need to know about? I'm just saying, Gene Stratton Porter, if you go to Goodreads and you look up quotes by her on Goodreads, you can just learn a lot of really great life lessons just by reading the quotes. They're so good. Anyway, my tea's getting cold and this is getting long, so I'm going to say adios and I'll be back on Monday with something. How's that for my <laughs> I don't know what I'll be doing, but I'll be doing something because something. And uh, yeah, just, just, I'll take all the help that I can get. 